I can read them out for you or people will pop in. They can open their own video okay. there. Sure. Okay. The live streams up, Anna. Do you want to go over to you for an intro? Perfect. I'll just get rid of that message in a minute. I'll, I'll do it. it. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. Bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde. And welcome in person or via Zoom to Walking Practices and Urban Imaginaries. This event is part of the MDES 2020. MDES 2022 Research Creation Residency at Force Base, running from May 2nd to the 12th, 2022. We are coming to you live from Concordia University's Force Space, which is located on unceded in indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. At Force Space, we work to connect people to the initiatives, research projects, and dialogues that are happening across Concordia University and with our colleagues. So we are pleased to have the opportunity to collaborate with William Couture, who organized this event and invited Carole Levesque to give us an overview of her most recent research. So I will let William introduce his project and Carole, but before doing so, just a quick note that we're running this as a meeting. So if you're here, uh, on Zoom with us, you're more than welcome to pop in and ask questions and comments by turning on your video and raising your hand. Otherwise, the chat is activated and we'll get to your comments as well if you pop them in there. We are live streaming this event and I'll put that link in the chat in just a minute. And on that note, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you. William, welcome. Hi, thank you, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you all for coming and thanks for the, oh yeah, that's true. Uh, Thanks for uh, for space for hosting uh, this event. Um, so this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carole Levesque, a professor and now I think program director at uh, um, Design de l'Environnement uh, at Lucam. Um, and she's also co-founder of the Bureau uh, d'Études de Pratique Indisciplinée, or the BP, uh, which focus on critical design processes. Uh, and she's also a researcher member at the CELAT, uh, Centre Culture, Art uh, et Société. Um, so Professor uh, Levac is also the author of A Propos de l'Initial en Architecture, uh, which was published in 2011. Um, Finding Room in Beirut, Places of the Everyday, published in 2019. And she co-edited the book Inventories, Documentation as a Research Project uh, at the BP, a book uh, that was very inspiring uh, for my own research. Um, so today's presentation should take about uh, 45 minutes and then we will have a uh, 15 minute uh, for discussion at the end. And uh, we would love to hear your questions or comment and they can be addressed either in French or in English. Uh, uh, so I have invited Professor Levesque uh, to give a talk today uh, since her work has been very uh, important and uh, of great inspiration. Uh, for my own research uh, that I'm currently doing. Um, and if you have time to stop by my stand at the end of the, the presentation, you will probably see some similarities in the, uh, the approach and the, the subject matter. Um, so you will see her work is truly fascinating and I think you'll be amazed by the quality and beauty of the drawings uh, and the intelligence of her research method. Um, and yeah, before I leave the floor to, uh, to Professor Levesque, I would also uh, like to say that after this presentation, uh, Maxime, my uh, classmate and friend, will be presenting uh, uh, a presentation in a similar format at 11.30. So if you want to, to stay by to look at that, I think it, it will be interesting for you as well. So uh, before I say too much, uh, I would like to warmly welcome Professor Levesque. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, William. Um, this is all very uh, new to me, all this <laughs> setup. So uh, there's too many screens, like it's... <laughs> um, and I've also, uh, I have some notes with me, but they're in French. So I'll try to translate as I go, but um, I know my work by heart, so it should be okay. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation, William. It's, um, I haven't uh, Kind of followed from afar the work of William, and it's it's been uh, interesting to uh, to talk about drawings and why draw it this way and not this way, and what to include and what not to include, and all that. So it's it's uh, it's been fun to have um, someone else. 
uh, ask uh, these same questions that I that I ask myself um, through my work. So I'll just share the screen now. Um, so I'll stop seeing myself on that big screen. It'll be less disturbing. Um, before I show you the the different um, project, the images I uh, I want to show to you this morning, um, I have to say that I've. The work that you will that I will show is something that I've been working on for about twelve years now. So this is a long, ongoing process, um, and I won't show you everything in detail because um, it would it would just take forever. Um, but I thought it would be a good idea to show you the the initial project that set kind of everything in motion. Um, to then spend more time on on what I'm up to now um, these days. Um, Kind of, anyway, you'll see kind of going back to where perhaps I should have started, but I guess one doesn't know where to start when you just begin. So you just kind of do things and things uh, kind of happen. So for these past 12 years, I've been working on trying to document uh, leftover spaces in the city, uh, or what we call in French, dernier vague. Um, mostly because uh, I think that they are the, they are witnesses of the transformation of our cities. They are leftover, abandoned, but they once were part of our cities, and they are still part of our cities in the ways that um, we we try to imagine what else could could we build there and how can we uh, not so much reintegrate them into the city, but more how can we profit profit from them. So. Um, as an architect or an urban designer, um, our first uh, sort of intuition when we see an empty space, an abandoned lot, is to think, okay, I could build this. I could, you know, build so many stories, put a store, put housing, uh, you know, whichever. And so our first, our first uh, initial thought uh, towards the space is how we can benefit from them, how we can fill them, how we can. Um, have them be pro uh, productive again in the city. But I think that these spaces, um, as they are, are part of our cities, uh, have an important role in giving a space to all kinds of things or uses that are not so much allowed in the city to take place. And that's where we people go to have to do these things. Um, there are also places where uh, um, the flora and fauna can, you know, come back uh, without us being, you know, worried about uh, whether this plant is pretty or not enough or not. Um, so they're a vibrant ecosystem and they're a refuge to a lot of smaller animals in the city. Um, and so I think that they um, they also um, they also as I was saying are a witness to sort of a a memory of what was in the city and in these empty spaces can allow us to to wonder or to think and reflect back onto what happened why why is this place empty what happened what was there why did it leave you know and how did it come to be the way it is so I think they're quite fascinating for understanding what happened in the city, what might happen in the city, but, but what's happening now, what's, what's the value of their present state. So, um, I'm not even gonna look at my notes. So, uh, so that's sort of uh, how I approach these things. And so I want um, to show you uh, the, the, the first project that I realized uh, along these lines. That was, uh, I was fortunate enough to have an appointment at the American University of Beirut uh, some years ago. And so for three years, I was in Beirut. And um, as I was walking around the city, I mean, I walk, we'll talk about walking again uh, during the, as a method of research. But so uh, when I get, uh, when I come into a new city, uh, I don't take the subway, I don't take the bus, I don't take public transport, I just walk. Um, and then I walk kind of day in, day out, um, just to get a feeling of what the city is like, to see the changes between one neighborhood to another, and to try to begin to pay attention to perhaps the more sensitive areas, or areas that, um, I'm interested in areas that are um, 
that have a life of their own, uh, but somehow don't quite fit in with a more general idea of what the city is trying to project. When I moved to Beirut, um, that was in 2009, uh, the national reconstruction of the city center was well underway, big skyscrapers, pretty streets, new plantings, you know, everything that the, that the good city uh, uh, should look like. Yet right next to it was this neighborhood um, that I show you these pictures of, that's a neighborhood that's called the Shura, that's really neighbor to the central district. Um, yet it was at the time left in a state of, as if the war, I just, the civil war had just ended the day before uh, with you know, holes in the buildings, with abandoned lots, um, most buildings without uh, electricity or running water. And I started to wonder, well, why is it that the, a central neighborhood is totally kept outside of the national effort to reconstruct, um, yet it has this vibrant community. And I, as I was talking about this neighborhood with colleagues or students from the school, it was clear that no one ventured in this neighborhood unless they were from the community or unless they had something very specific to do there. And so it was this kind of absent neighborhood within the city. And, and so I started to document it. And I, I started to um, do these photography uh, documentations quite systematically. At first, not so much because I wasn't quite sure how to go about it, but then eventually, uh, it became a question of, for example, in these images, looking at all the green spaces or the green appearances in the neighborhood, uh, looking at you know the, the the kids on the street or the men sitting on the sidewalk on plastic chairs, passages, and so I started to organize these images um, so as to try to make categories of things to look for within the neighborhood. Uh, I have to mention that taking pictures in this neighborhood wasn't quite uh, welcome, let's say. So it had to be done with a very small um, point and shoot camera that I could quickly and easily put in my pen pocket. Um, but it also means that to, to accumulate all these images and to, to have the time to see occurrences that happen again and again, I had to go very often um, along a, a, a long period of time, different times of the day, different days of the week, to try to really get a sense. And so this idea of walking as a, as a research practice uh, became, well, not only a good thing, but essential in terms of being able to document this neighborhood. And so these collages that you see here are made up, it depends, it varies from, let's say, 50 to 120 pictures, maybe. And those were because in Beirut, things are quite tight. And so you, you often don't have a, a whole lot of setback to take a nice big picture. But also, as I was saying, uh, I, it had to be quick to take the pictures, to put it in the pen pocket and all that. Um, it was much easier to go with my little camera and kind of take the pictures, you know, whichever way, to then collage them and make a bigger picture than to set up a tripod and try you know, to be articulate about it. But in the end, um, these collages allowed each time I, I, I kind of collage them together, like if I print them and I try to reconstruct the image, the image is slightly different at the same time every time and so it, it allows for the eye to wander within the image because lines don't quite line up and all this um, and it, it forces one to kind of walk through the image and reconstruct uh, these kind of uh, disaligned uh, perspectives in a way that is quite similar to if one was walking in the neighborhood. Uh, this is the beautiful uh, church, uh, St. Georges Church, that is now covered with a tower. When I went back in 2018, the tower was on their way. Uh, we did some really nice projects for the students in this uh, church. But so as I was doing all this documentation, um, I was thinking, well, it's all nice to document and to see these things, but, but then what? You know, what do I do with this? And so I wanted to try to gather all this knowledge, all this acquired knowledge about the neighborhood uh, into 
uh, into an architectural language. Um, and so I didn't want to make a, like a representation. I didn't want to sit there and draw what I was looking at as an observation drawing, but I, I really wanted to translate. And so as I was walking around the neighborhood, uh, different situations, you know, happened. I was, I, I met people, I, different things, kind of, different kind of funny stories happened. And so I decided to use these stories as, as the anchor to the translation of the physical environment that I was documenting towards architecture. And so these little um, machines that are kind of um, follies or installations type of thing are to me a translation into architecture of the situation. So what you have on these images on the left is a description of the situation that I first wrote down like seconds after it happened in my notebook in, a, in English because I used to live in English when I was there. And then, um, then it's translated into French, that's the column on the left, and then it's translated into Arabic, which is the right column, and then it's translated into architecture, which are the drawings. So to me, it was through translation, uh, I was trying to get to a point where the translation would lead me into this language of architecture, if I can say it this way. Um, and so the point was to uh, build these little installations and kind of give them to the neighborhood and then see what would happen of them. Uh, but I came back to Montreal a little too quickly. I was talking at the, when I moved back to Montreal, I was talking with a, a, a basket maker to try to weave these enormous baskets. Um, and the conversation wasn't so much as to how to weave it, but why. <laughs> Um, so the, the conversation was really trying to, to have the basket weaver kind of understand, you know, why on earth would someone weave a half basket, a meter and a half wide, like it, it just made no sense, right? Um, so anyway, so I was at this point and came back to Montreal and so the, the installations or the machines were never built, but I felt the need to give them a home in Beirut nonetheless. So I, um, I decided to draw them into uh, a Lebanese landscape, a Beirut landscape, uh, with uh, elements of Beirut that, I, that are to me quite significant of the city. So if, if one has gone to Beirut, I think one would be able to recognize different elements uh, without knowing where it is exactly, because this is not a specific place, but it's just kind of different dispersed elements of the city that are put together to, uh, to create this, this uh, Beiruti environment for the, for the machines. Also, because the, uh, the city is quite dense, and there's, as I was saying, there's oftentimes there's not, like you can't see the horizon very often, I felt that the drawings needed to be really uh, filled um, and I wanted to have as little paper left as possible. Evidently, one needs to have paper, otherwise you have to see the paper, otherwise you don't see the drawing. But I wanted the drawing to be really, really dense and um, to convey the sense of, you know, kind of immersion within the, within the city. So these drawings are small, they're 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. Um, and they're drawn in, in two dimensions. So it's a, a sort of elevation. There's no perspective in, this draw, in these drawings. Um, and I wanted to, I didn't want the perspective to play into the drawings because they are sort of collages and the drawing uh, in perspective to me would kind of convey the idea that I'm placed somewhere specific and I'm looking towards some other place. So the two dimensionality was important to me in terms of, of getting rid of the point of view. Um, so from this, um, from this uh, project down in Beirut, uh, when I came back to Montreal, I, evidently the, the um, circumstances or of, of Montreal and Beirut are very different. Um, and so I wanted to, to take this opportunity to, to you know, push the project or the methodology a little farther. And I started to wonder, well, if in Beirut, I looked at what, 
what are the uses or how do we use these spaces? Like Pop and Montreal, perhaps I could look at, well, what is this landscape? What does it look like? What is a Penebac? What is an abandoned space? How can we define it? How can we talk about it uh, with cer a certain amount of clarity and precision? So I thought, well, I have to go and, and meet the terrain vague. I need to go look at it. And so what you have here is the island of Montreal that you can recognize. And the red dots that you see is uh, the line that I followed. So I walked across the island of Montreal from east to west. And the, the red dots are where I, um, I spent more time documenting a specific place and then made, uh, in the end, about 120 of these photo collages, the same way I had done in, in Beirut. But because the spaces are much wider, I mean, there's some collages that have, I think the, the biggest one has 195 photos, I think, collaged together. Um, so depending on, you know, if I print them and, you know, I can print them large and it can become a super big image. Um, so there's 120 of these collages uh, that are sometimes a little bit of a puzzle to put back together, as you can imagine with this one, for example. Uh, but they are all significant places in terms of, 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 I would say, of landscape. As I was saying at the beginning of the presentation, as an architect, when you see um, a terrain vague, you tend to say, well, if we could build this or that. And so I tried to avoid the terrain vague that were um, that had definite boundaries that were in between buildings or that had a fence around that I could see that I could measure easily with my eye. And I, I devoted more attention to the ones that are fuyant. Um, I'm not sure how to say it in English, but that you just kind of escape the you know there's the boundaries are difficult to to grasp. Um, so this is uh, the 120 collages that um, this is a sort of a replica of the wall I had in my office for two years. I had all these collages in front of me and this is in an exhibition that was uh, produced in 2019 where we just kind of moved my wall from the office down to the, down to the, the exhibition center. Um, but so with these, uh, with all these photographs and all this, I mean, you can imagine it, it took all in all over six days, 42 hours of walking, which doesn't seem like a lot, but after six to eight hours of walking, you know, one starts to feel the, <laughs> the distance in one's leg. Um, and so with all these uh, photographs, I was trying to figure out a way to, uh, to define what is a terrain vague and how we can categorize it. So this is a, a, a just a, a screenshot of a, of a web page that we've created where the 120 uh, sites that I photograph are down below with a little opacity. And so if one clicks on, on one of them, then you can see the different characteristics that pop up, uh, whether the plants, the kind of soil, uh, Etc. And so there's much more like this is scroll, it scrolls uh, sideways. And then you can start to crisscross the different characteristics. This was all nice and fun, but it, it also, again, is like they're all the same, but they're all different. How can we categorize them? It doesn't quite work. So I selected 12 terrain vague uh, that were not the defined or the final categories, but that were representative of potential categories. So it had um, uh, sort of wild trees, let's say wild growth, uh, pylons, electrical pylons, uh, remnants of a railroad, um, garbage, that sort of thing. Uh, and so with a group of students, we went there and we surveyed these places as we would of an existing building. Um, and made these uh, kind of objective drawings, trying to draw them as if we would draw a, a building to be built. We also collected a number of, of um, objects, which are witnesses of you know, uses and people coming to these places. Um, we also made a herber. I have a difficulty in English with there are too many R's in this word. Um, herbarium, uh, I think that's what it is. 
Um, so anyway, we collected about 100 species of plants, which we dried out, identified, and every time, every, uh, every specimen, every object, is we keep, it, keep track of what day it was collected, where it was collected, on, on which of the terrain vague, etc. And then from all this documentation and kind of going back again and again and again to the same places, started to accumulate kind of um, the most prominent elements of, uh, of different penne vagues that I crossed within a day's walk. So I walked the island over six days, so there are six drawings. And so each drawing, and these are the preparatory drawings, each drawing is kind of a elevation of a day's walk across the island of Montreal. So these drawings, uh, you can see that they are as dense as the ones from Beirut. Um, not so much because there's no setback. Obviously here in, in this condition, there was uh, a lot of setback. That's what I was looking for. But I wanted them to be as dense because I wanted to show how rich and full they are, even though we see them as empty spaces. So I wanted to make the drawings in ways which wouldn't allow for us to imagine what else we could build or how we could intervene in them. So I wanted the drawings to show these places as, as places worthy of being there as they are at the time that I saw them. Um, and also places that have objects, that have buildings, that have people that go there. Uh, so places that are really part of the life of the city. So, th so these uh, drawings are much bigger than the ones from Beirut. These are, the square ones are 29 inches square. The big ones are double, so 29 by 158 inches, uh, which, and they're this size because I wanted them to be as large as possible, but um, they had to fit on my drafting table. And so <laughs> this is the length of, of, of my, my parallel row. Uh, ruler, so it's just really as dumb as this, as to why they are this big. Um, so this uh, was shown in a, an exhibition at the Centre de Design at UCAM in 2019. And the idea, even though the, the, my aim was to eventually draw these places, um, it was very important to me to show the entire process and to show how one gets to draw these drawings. And so the exhibition showed every piece of information, all the steps. Um, so as, as you see in this photo, if we're in the back of the exhibition, which is really the beginning of the exhibition, you can see all the layers um, of, of the work. And so this, this project went on for three and a half years with uh, a group of 13 students that weren't always all of them there, but uh, coming and going. So with a kind of a large team. There's also a video, um, so on, on top of, of all this documentation, there was this idea of, of showing the stillness of these places. So there's a, a three minute video per season, per penne bag, the, the 12 that we surveyed. And there's also a sound recording that was played in the, in the exhibition. So the idea was to, to kind of augment the, the ways uh, of, the means of representation, because each mean of representation gives out new information. And it's through this accumulation of mediums that one can get sort of the full um, understanding of what the Tanevac might be. So at the end of this, so this is what I'm, I'm working on now. Um, I've, I've now moved to Rome um, after Beirut in Montreal. Um, because I thought, well, if, if the, all this work in Montreal didn't still doesn't allow me to describe clearly what is a tenet bag and put them put the different tenet bag in categories because each time there's something that doesn't fit. I thought, well, I need to, perhaps I need to move back and see, well, how, how does it begin? Where does it start? And, you know, if, if I could find, if I could find the first tenet bag or the, the first representations of a tenet bag, perhaps there, perhaps there would there be a key for understanding and be able to say, this is what the Terni bag is, and then be done with it. So it's a bit of a joke saying all, you know, all roads lead to Rome, but in this case, they, it actually does. So what you have here is a short list 
of different words that are used to talk about the terrain vague in the literature. Um, and the first one on top terrain vague of Manuel de Sola Morales is, uh, Manuel de Sola Morales is or was a, a Catalan architect who came to Montreal in 1994, participate in, uh, in a conference at the Canadian Center for Architecture where he presented a paper called Terrain Vague and I forget the title, but anyway, he talked about the Terrain Vague as a, as a, a new condition uh, that emerged from the post-industrial -industri city. So in the 90s, you know, the big changes in cities, uh, industries closing down, moving uh, other places. And a lot of cities, um, in his case, most, he was talking mostly about European cities, were left with big swatches of you know, urban fabric kind of just abandoned. And the, a lot of photographers started to, to take pictures of them and sort of create this fascination about them. And Salah Morales talked about the terrain vague as this, as this new condition of the post-industrial city. And so since uh, 1995, so he gave the talk in 94, it was published in 95, uh, this text has kind of become the, the one big reference for anyone who wants to talk about the Terrain Vague. And so all the, the, the following uh, terms, and there are, there are more, but uh, all these terms are post Sola Morales, and most of them at one point or another make reference to Sola Morales. And um, three or four of them go as far as saying that Sola Morales invented the expression. Um, so this, this, it's as if like 1994, big discovery, Terrain Vague in the cities. Um, but it is not the case. And so I thought, well, what if I go back? So if I want to go to the origin of the Terrain Vague, the 1994 version of Sola Morales isn't the first one. So I started to go back. Uh, and, it, and quickly, uh, one finds all sorts of things, and I mean, I, I'm not going to uh, show all of them to you now, but uh, if we just think about the Terrain Vague movie of Marcel Carnet, where the protagonist kind of tried to escape the boring life of the Paris banlieue uh, and kind of hang out on the Terrain Vague. Um, the first, one of the first or the early uh, uh, representation in the photograph is the picture of Man Ray called Terre Vague in 1929. Uh, we could say that the photos of Adje around the, the in the zone around uh, Paris would probably be the first images. But then, if we if we get out of the visual representation and go into the literature, then there are uh, other examples. Older examples, Victor Hugo talked about the Terrain Vague in Les Miserables, uh, in Exola. There's a whole bunch of, um, of 19th century authors that talk about the Terrain Vague. But the first one to use the expression seems to be, uh, you know, I haven't read everything in the world, so I don't know, but it, it, with other authors um, that seem to agree, seems to be Chateaubriand in 1802. Uh, where he describes um, a site near Athens uh, and he uses the expression terrain vague. But then if, if I, you know, if one keeps digging uh, in old dictionaries, uh, for instance, this one of Frédéric Godefroy, um, one begins to find um, definitions or examples of where terrain vague or vague or friche um, is used and um, 1500 uh, vague is the act of, of to uh, to leave uh, in a state of abandonment and devastation um, as far as uh, 13th century where if there's uh, if we find a land that is vague then we should build houses um, there's also uh, through the middle ages we call terre vague et vague um, uh, lands that were not owned, that were not the property of anyone and allowed for less fortunate farmers who had a few animals to let them uh, graze. So there were, so these examples um, show that, you know, 
1994 isn't the turning point or the invention of Carnaval, but it, it has a long history. And then and through the French language, different variations of vague uh, are used in different examples as, as marking places of abandonment. Um, it can be either land, it can be houses, it can be um, people uh, even, but this idea of, of kind of the uh, you're, you're kind of left unable to do anything about them and you're like oh my goodness you know what's going to happen with this kind of kind of state of mind um so i keeping go, trying to you know trying to find the origins of this still i thought well perhaps i need to go to when the land, when landscape was invented when, as a as an aesthetic, as an aesthetic genre uh, when um, the landscape started to emerge as something to be worthy of, um, of painting. We know that landscape emerged first through um, the Netherlands painters where it is painted through a window and then eventually uh, painters will be interested what's beyond the window and will, will paint um, um, biblical figures in a landscape and there's all kinds of theory about color uh, in this case Bethsinia where you need to start with the with the, the, the ochre and then you go to the brown and the green and the blue uh, as in a way to build slowly this this effect of, of the long long territorial perspective um, so there's all kinds of, of theories to then eventually let go of the biblical figures altogether and then construct a way of looking at nature that we now call paysage uh, or landscape um, to, to uh, a way of looking at nature that still follows us today. So what is a good landscape? How do we look at landscape? How do we build it going from the near to the far with the, you know, the, shad the, the shadows and the, and the more lit spaces and all this. So there's kind of a, I wouldn't say a science of landscape, but there's kind of a, a know-how as to how to build an adequate landscape. And this has followed us till today as to how we look at the place and we say, oh, this is such a nice landscape. Um, so I thought, well, if, uh, and there are some uh, instances, for example, in the Encyclopedia of Denis Dutroux, where he says that the landscape uh, represents um, uncultivated, uninhabited sites. Um, so the, the idea of landscape is built upon looking at abandonment. Um, so I thought, okay, if, if, if the idea of landscape is built upon this idea of abandonment, then, then how, how does it form itself? Where does it come from? So um, as you know, Rome, after the empire uh, kind of fell through, the population was much reduced and kind of gathered around the Tiber where you see here on the map. And I can't point to you, but I'm sure you can recognize the Colosseum, that round figure sort of in the middle of the image. And just up from it is the Roman Forum. And then up from the Roman Forum is the edge of the city. So a lot of, of artists, painters and uh, engravers would go around, would do the big tour of Europe and end up in Italy and then eventually come to Rome. And they would, uh, for many of them, oh, I have my mouse here that works, okay. So a lot of them will come to this point on, on, the, on the Capitoline Hill and will look this way out towards what all this area that once was inhabited um, in antiquity was at this point in the, in the 15th century called the disabitato, so the uninhabited uh, area. And there's all kinds of descriptions as how it is dangerous and women shouldn't venture there and all kinds of, of stories like this. And so the artist would kind of stand here and look out this way towards abandonment and then paint and draw this disabitato as, as sort of this idealized or starting to be idealized way of looking at landscape and constructing what is a good landscape. So this is looking back. So we're in the disabitato looking back towards the city. Uh, but so as soon as, uh, as early as 1430s, um, the first 
uh, drawings and renditions of the Roman form starting to appear. And so I've gathered here a bunch of images that are more or less taken from this point on the Capitol and Hill looking towards the Zabitazo. Um, and so the, the different artists will uh, include or exclude certain monuments or move them a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, depending on what it is that they want to create as a landscape. Um, but uh, all of these will also include different ways that the forum was used. Uh, it was for a long, long time called the Campo Vaccino, like we see here, so the, the field for cows. Um, and so the forum to me, I mean, this is a hypothesis. This is not like a pure science and the, and the truth that everyone should believe, but, um, but I, I look at it as the sort of the archetype or the first Tenhe Vague upon which this idea of landscape is largely built. And so I thought, well, if this is the first Tenhe Vague and if at this point in time, or through these few centuries, it was used as a way to build an idealized landscape or what a landscape should be, uh, then perhaps I ought to go to Rome myself and stand on the Capitol and Hill and look at it for what it is now today. It's not a Terre Vague anymore, it's an archeological site. It's a touristic attraction. The monuments have been you know, uncovered. Uh, some have been removed, others have been rebuilt. Um, so it's a collage in of itself, I think, um, as it is now. But I thought if I go back there and look, and you see it here, if I look from the same point of view and try to draw this Terre Vague, then perhaps this drawing could be the sort of the representation of the original Terre Vague, and from there try to see what can come out of it. So as with the Beirut and the, Rome, uh, the Montreal drawing, I went around, I mean, I spent a whole, a lot, a lot of time on the Roman form, um, documenting, photographing everything. I'm not gonna show you the 2000 or so pictures that I have, uh, but through all this documentation and I started to build the drawing, of course it had to have all the main monuments but in between the monuments, it had to have all these other smaller details, these little things around. So these are just the preparation drawings. Um, so I go through several iterations to eventually come up with the, uh, with the composition. Um, one difficulty I had in Rome was that uh, I didn't have a drafting table and, sorry, and uh, I wanted my drawings to be even bigger. So uh, they are made of 940 centimeter squares uh, and I had to draw on the wall like this for a while to eventually get to a, a point where the drawing looks like a, sort of a, a paint by number. <laughs> uh, um, and so at the beginning it goes well, but six months later when I'm in an area, you know, I, I kind of forget what the lines are about and it's a little bit difficult. And then I always draw with these technical pens that are a quarter millimeter uh, wide. So it's very thin. Um, and then it gets to, uh, these are just a few, um, a few details of this drawing. Um, and the drawing is, uh, the drawing is a, a meter 20, so 120 meter, no, 120 centimeter uh, by 120 centimeters. So it's fairly large, uh, but the idea is to represent the, the plants, the animal life. Um, there are a lot of birds in this one, uh, but also all the textures of the different uh, bricks and stones and, and all that. So I don't know if you can recognize the viewpoint from, from the sort of the older masters, but the idea was to then be in dialogue with them. Um, so as I was, you know, in Rome, might as well take advantage of it. I started to think about um, if I can define exactly what the Terre Vague is. Perhaps we need to. I need to look at them in terms of what what creates them, and then our relation to them, rather than try to make a definition that would be descriptive. So. Um, 
So the three ways I think that a Canada comes to be is either as in the Foro Romano, uh, sort of, it just, it just happens. It's just, it's just life. You know, one event happens, someone leaves, uh, someone doesn't take care of a house, it falls down, we don't take care of the garden, the plants overgrow, and then eventually, you know, through time, you realize, oh, there's a tenny bag next to my house and I don't know how it came to be. So it, it just kind of happens. In this case, it's, you know, emperors falling, coming, popes, wars, famine, all kinds of things like that. The other way that the tenny bag appear is through pure disinterest. Think and uh, infrastructures are are probably the best demonstration of a disinterested landscape. We just have to think about all the the sort of the I wouldn't say quarrel, but the the arguments that the Hem just created recently in Montreal. How you know putting a big infrastructure destroys cities more or less, and it's just, you know, it's pure functionality. So I thought, well, if, you know, I tried to find uh, uh, an antique or from antiquity, uh, an infrastructure that did exactly that and that still um, creates the Teneva within the city. So I walked along the Aqua Claudio, the aqueduct. So these are um, pictures from the 60s where people kind of built, you know, um, random houses along it and all that and so I, I walked from the sort of the territory the big landscape through the city all the way to probably the smallest than a bag possible um, and then this aqueduct ends at just next to the Foro Romano so it kind of made sense to, to, to draw this uh, bag and so the same thing I went I walked as a, a Ten and a half kilometer long stretch before it would go down into tunnels. So I walked that ten and a half kilometers probably fifteen times, um, taking pictures, making drawings, and slowly accumulating details to then come up with uh, a, a composition that I thought uh, rendered this walk from the, the large territory or the big landscape all the way to the city. So again, details buildings, plants, um, insect, I don't know if you can see it up on the right, um, birds, all sort of details that make, that make the terrain vague kind of living. The third reason why a terrain vague is, I think is through, or is maintained is through views. And so I went to document, and, um, what do you call this uh, in Gallagher? Uh, a, gar a landfill, I guess, like a garbage where you just throw garbage, you accumulate garbage. Uh, at the Monte dei Cocci in Testaccio, which um, during antiquity was just outside the walls of the city. And as you see on the image on the left, the boats would come up the river and arrive at the port of Testaccio and unload the merchandise that would then be taken into the city by land. And so what you see on the right are called amphoras. They're like really large terracotta uh, kind of containers that were too heavy, too big to carry into the city. So they would be unloaded from the boats and then the, the wine or the oil would be dumped into smaller containers and that would be taken into the city. So these large containers, which could not be reused, were broken into pieces and then just kind of piled up along the river there and created this mount, which is 30 meters high by, it's just enormous, and is still there today, um, where you can still see the, the pieces of amphoras piled up, uh, vegetation has taken over and all this, but through the years, so since you know antiquity, this place has remained because there was constant use of it. So people would build these little, uh, one room houses along it. They would at some point dug tunnels in because they could store wine at the, at the stable temperature and so on. So this, this terrain vague was maintained because it was used, was used informally, uh, but nonetheless was used. So again, I went, I walked around it on top of it uh, many times accumulating images, details to then slowly build this composition to then lead to this drawing 
uh, where we go from the, the street level all the way to the top. I don't know if you can see the cross all the way to the top right, which is on the top of the mountain. Um, again, a few details. There are animals there. There used to be goats, but now there are only chickens. Um, different types of housing, um, the plant life, and all that. So these three drawings are, to me, sort of the this representation or the study of why a terrain vague comes to be. Uh, and then I thought, well, I need to see now that I, I know why the terrain vague comes to be. Uh, what's our sort of what does it provide in the city or how what's our relation to it and so I went back to the forum drawing and started to play around well what if I take out the vegetation what if I only look at the at the columns what if I only look at the bird life or the animal life and try to see what are the different um, I would say figures that emerge from that um, and also I was trying to, to try to figure out a, a different way of representation. Um, I tried different ways of drawing, uh, but making drawings of my drawing seemed a little uh, redundant or silly. Um, but so uh, as you see in these three studies, uh, the three figures that I've, I'm now working on are the terrain vague that is used as a passage, the terrain vague that acts as a field, and the terrain vague where it's just mayhem, it's just like disorderly, things fall down, no one really does anything, and it's just, you know, it just kind of happens this way. And so looking at my drawing as the original site, instead of the original site being, you know, for real outside in the world, um, I tried to sort of go back through my method of documentation to try to build through collages using the photos that I took on those sites uh, to build new landscapes, possible landscapes, as if they were real places. So it's using my drawing as the original site to uh, then um, come up with these three figures of passage, field, and mayhem to build new landscapes that don't exist, but that they exist through my drawing. So these are the collages from the Roman Forum. And then I did the same with the, with the aqueduct. And I am now uh, about to, this is where I am at now, about to do the same collages for the, uh, the Monte dei Cochi, so the, the Empora Mountain. So I think I'll leave it to you here. I've been talking for a long time and you've kind of seen pretty much everything. But uh, yeah, I'll stop here today. Thank you. This is my mic, no, it's not working. Um, it's over again. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karel, I think it's, it's a very rich presentation. I have so much to say. I have a bunch of questions. I don't know if there's some from the, the public. Do you want to ask something or just add a comment? Does it work? Um, so I, maybe I'm, uh, I'm going to speak French. Maybe I'm wrong, you me, but I feel like there's a certain tension in fact, entre, vos dessins qui sont très respectueux en fait de, de, de l'ambiguïté et du caractère vague justement là, de, de terrain vague. Puis euh, ce désir de classifier ou de définir qu'est-ce qu'un un, un, un terrain vague ou de le systématiser en catégorie. Mm -hmm. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a peut-être un danger ou une espèce d'invitation à, à coloniser ces terrains vagues-là à travers la représentation? Je pense que c'est quelque chose que vous avez parlé là. Euh, Historiquement, dans le fond, c'est la représentation des terrains vagues à travers la peinture était comme un moyen un peu d'idéaliser de, de, qu'est-ce que devrait mm -hmm. être dans le fond la, le, le landscape. Est-ce que vous pensez que c'est peut-être quelque chose qui peut nous rapporter? Ben, en fait, euh, c'est sûr qu'à partir du moment où on donne une présence à quelque chose à travers la représentation, les gens s'y intéressent et on risque que les gens aient l'occupé, le transforment, et, etc. etc. Euh, je, moi, j'ai une grande appréciation pour les terrains vagues, mais je ne suis pas non plus une grande... Je ne suis pas à la défense du terrain vague à tout prix, parce que, de toute façon, la défense du terrain vague à tout prix, 
euh, mène généralement euh, à la transformation du terrain vague aussi, parce que là, il y a des règles, puis il faut faire attention aux plantes, puis tout ça. Quoi. Euh, mais en même temps, euh, je n'ai pas, pas envie d'aider les gens à aller coloniser ou à aller utiliser ces centres-là. Par exemple, à Montréal, je ne sais pas combien de gens m'ont demandé « Ah, tu sais, cette photo-là, genre, tu sais, je... » Euh, Peux-tu me dire c'est où j'aimerais aller faire un truc? Euh, ça m'a l'air d'être un endroit parfait. Je ne dis pas c'est où. Je ne révèle jamais. La carte est, est tellement floue qu'on on a des grands repères, là, mais euh, je ne révèle jamais c'est où. Euh, parce que je n'ai pas envie de participer à la transformation de ces lieux-là, mais en même temps, je ne vais pas monter aux brigades et, euh, et les défendre non plus. Je pense que le terrain vague, c'est quelque chose qui est dynamique, qui, qui apparaît, qui disparaît dans la ville, puis ça fait partie des processus de construction de la ville. C'est très bien comme ça. Euh, mon, disons, mon intention, c'est plutôt de, de montrer que pendant que le terrain vague est là, ce n'est pas, pas une présence néfaste, ce n'est pas grave s'il y a un terrain vague à côté de nous, à côté de chez nous, euh, mais c'est plutôt quelque chose qui a une valeur en soi et qu'on devrait à apprécier pour le, le faire participer dans, dans notre expérience quotidienne de la ville. Euh, ouais, c'est surtout ça, je dirais. Je ne sais pas si je réponds à la question. Oui, oui. Mais... <rire> okay. Euh, Peut-être que je peux y aller aussi dans les commentaires. Ça, ça me fait penser, ben justement, je pense que Maxime l'a bien dit, l'espèce de... Il y a aussi un, un côté vague au, au dessin d'élévation, dans le sens qu'on ne peut pas replacer un lieu particulier. Euh, puis je serais curieux de savoir par rapport au au collage photographique mm -hmm. qui sont, tu sais, là, c'est vraiment un point de vue fixe, perspective, on, est, on se sent vraiment présent à un point dans l'espace. Comment tu, tu passes de un à l'autre? C'est comme une espèce de transition. Mais... Oui, en fait, c'est drôle, ça, depuis que j'ai commencé à parler de ces choses-là, c'est la question, puis euh, c'est parce qu'il y a comme un clash. C'est que non, normalement, mon processus se termine avec le dessin. Mm -hmm. Et là, ce que j'essaie de faire, c'est si je commence avec le dessin, si je fais le processus à l'envers, en fait, pour que j'arrive, que je termine avec une représentation photographique d'un lieu existant, mais qui, dans le fond, n'existe pas. Il n'existe qu'à travers mon dessin. Donc, ça ne veut pas dire que je m'amuse, <rire> euh, mais c'est aussi, euh, j'essaie de voir, si je fais le chemin inverse, -ce que, comment ça m'aide à, à mieux regarder mon dessin? Parce que dans les dessins, une fois qu'ils sont faits, c'est comme un peu la finalité de la chose. Et après, c'est de dire, ben Okay, ils sont là, ils existent, je les aime bien, mon dessin, mais, mais j'en fais quoi, tu sais, mais encore. Et donc là, euh, j'essaie à travers ce projet-là de voir ben, qu'est-ce que le dessin peut produire d'autre, comment ça, le, le dessin peut m'aider à mieux réfléchir à la condition du verre. Donc c'est pour ça que là, je, et redessiner à partir du dessin, pour moi, c'était trop difficile de dessiner autrement ce que j'avais déjà dessiné. Ouais. Et le fait de retourner vers la photographie bien, me permet de me dégager de ça. Mais c'est vrai que dans les dessins, il y a une espèce de flou, c'est-à-dire c'est un collage, puis des fois, on ne voit pas très bien où les formes commencent ou finissent. Euh, mais euh, mais, mais c'est très précis mm -hmm. en termes de, je veux dire, je, je dessine des petites lignes et lignes, je suis très attentive, je très, il, y une, il, y une, il y a une grande précision dans le dessin, même si au final, ça semble quelque chose de plutôt vague. Mm -hmm. Oui, le, le dessin, mais même dans le détail, on voyait sur certains, euh, certains agrandissements, on peut aller chercher tu sais, un insecte ou des, des espèces de, de des fleurs tu sais, qu'on peut reconnaître. Mais ce que je me demande, c'est en fait, tu sais, à partir de la documentation, euh, des promenades, puis du, des inventaires de, de matériaux, tout ça, la composition du dessin, de l'élévation, euh, est-ce que c'est, je ne sais pas, intuitif ou il y a comme une espèce de... Il y a aussi les échelles. On, des fois, il y a des, une énorme borne fontaine, puis à côté, il y a une petite, un petit poteau électrique mm -hmm. tout petit. T'sais, comment ce jeu-là se, se fait? Que... Oui, mais je dirais que c'est à demi-intuitif puis à demi-informé. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a... J'essaie dans les dessins de, de, de donner une expérience pareil, là, mais une expérience qui se rapproche de l'expérience de la marche. Donc, quand on marche, on regarde au loin pour voir où on s'en va, mais on regarde à ses pieds sur un terrain vague là, pour voir y a t un déchet, y a t une roche, y a t un touché. Mm -hmm. Et donc, il y a toujours ce, ce, ce regard constant entre le proche et le lointain. Et pour moi, ça, c'est un élément important dans le dessin. 
Donc, des fois, si la bande fontaine est très grande et que y a le, 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 le pinot est à côté tout petit, mais c'est peut-être que dans ce, dans ce rapport avec la marche, ce rapport d'échelle entre en jeu. Je trouve que c'est important de mettre en place dans le dessin. Avec les changements d'échelle aussi, ça permet de, de mettre en valeur des choses qu'on qu remarque moins habituellement. Les insectes, on les voit à partir du moment où on s'assoit par terre et qu'on attend qu'ils viennent autour de la ruine. Euh, donc, de les mettre en grand dans le dessin, mais ils, 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 leur présence devient importante. Mmh. Alors que si je les dessinais gros comme ça, on, on est pas, en fait, il y a plein d'insectes qui sont perdus dans le dessin. Euh, des fois, moi, je me souviens même plus trop où exactement j'arrive plus à les retrouver. Euh, mais euh, mais c'est ça, donc c'est à la fois un effort de, de faire cette composition de paysage avec le proche, le lointain, l'expérience de la marche, mais aussi il faut que graphiquement, là, que la composition fonctionne. Euh, des fois, bon, je dessine un truc, j'ai une idée. Des fois aussi, ça, sais, il y a plein d'erreurs dans mes dessins où je voulais faire quelque chose, puis finalement, mon trait est trop long, je passe par-dessus, j'oublie un truc. Donc, il faut que je compose avec l'erreur. Oui. Je prends du recul, je regarde, je dis, ah, ben là, il faut que ce soit plus foncé, là, il faut que j'ajoute ça. Donc, c'est aussi un, une planification au départ, mais dans l'action de dessiner, il y a plein de choses qui se produisent, puis il faut composer avec ça aussi. Um, Est-ce qu'on a d'autres questions? Do you have other questions? Je vais essayer de formuler une question intelligible parce que c'est une recherche très, très riche avec le processus, les méthodologies que tu préconises autour des euh, les matériaux, les médiums aussi, de, disons, disons de recherche d'enquête, ce que chacun révèle aussi, la photographie, par exemple, avec tes, avec tes photocollages où on pourrait extraire une partie de l'image puis en, en fait la remplacer par, par un... un un fragment d'une autre image, puis en fait, le regard se, se, se recalibre, se reconstitue constamment comme celui du marcheur ou celle de la marcheuse mmh. euh, sur ces lieux-là. Euh, les, les conditions que tu explores aussi sont vraiment aussi en, entre le, le privé et le public. Est-ce que des questions, par exemple, des urban commons ou des communs urbains qui, qui euh, pourraient s'arrimer un peu à ces questions-là, c'est-à-dire de ces territoires-là qui ne sont pas tout à fait déterminés, puis qui sont, qui, sont, qui sont aussi des lieux, disons, d'appropriation, disons, d'usage, comme tu soulignes, puis d'archéologie aussi, parce qu'il y a une archéologie aussi presque infrastructurelle, aussi mm -hmm. même à Rome avec les aqueducs, au même titre que tes dessins, par exemple, que tu as produits pour le terrain vague à Montréal, euh, on voit encore des, par, on voit, par exemple des pylônes hydroélectriques. Donc, euh, je me demande comment euh, tu, tu euh, en fait, comment cette, cette, euh, cette expérience-là t'amène aussi à, à, à réfléchir à, à cette condition-là du du terrain vague, une époque où il y a de plus en plus, disons, de encroachment. Je pense à des villes comme Berlin, où je, je suis retourné il y a déjà presque sept ans, j'avais déjà constaté une accélération, euh, disons, quand même, euh, euh, disons, un peu plus préoccupante sur, le, sur, la, sur la condition entre ces, ces, ces tiers d'espace-là, ouais. qui, qui étaient quand même de plus en plus euh, réduits à l'invisibilité. Donc, euh, donc, la question, c'est... Est-ce est que, est -ce que ces méthodologies te, te, te permettent, euh, en fait, comment tu arrimes ces méthodologies, ces, ces processus-là à des, à des réalités aussi contemporaines du terrain qui sont dans, dans un, un spectrum aussi là, où les valeurs foncières, les, disons, les, les questions de propriété sont aussi euh, complexes à mm -hmm. faire ça. Bref, désolé pour la longueur <rire> de la question, mais voilà. Ça va, ça va. Ouais. Bien, euh, je dirais que euh, dans les, les situations, que en fait, toutes les situations sont vraiment différentes. Il mm -hmm. euh, y a des lieux où on pense qu'on est seul au monde mm -hmm. et tout à coup, il y a un dispositif de sécurité qui va se mettre à gueuler vraiment pour te faire peur et ça fonctionne et tu décantes. Euh, D'autres endroits, en fait, là où je vois que les, les, les gens se réapproprient, bon, évidemment, avec la, la question euh, de, 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 de la difficulté d'appropriation du logement, d'abordabilité, euh, ça devient des lieux de plus en plus, disons, euh, ben, ils sont disponibles à l'habitation, mais ce n'est pas encore ici, peut-être parce que l'hiver est trop rude, mais peut-être que ça arrivera à un moment donné. Euh, mais c'est sûr que dans, dans, là où ça fonctionne, c'est soit qu'il y a une, deux personnes qui sont discrètes, qui s'installent, qui font leur petite affaire, ou alors que c'est une communauté qui s'organise et qui, là, qui prennent possession de la chose, advienne que pour eux. Euh, entre les deux, c'est plus difficile, je dirais, parce que même si ces lieux-là sont à l'abandon, ils sont la propriété de quelqu'un ou d'une entreprise, et selon le, le bon vouloir ou le, le manque de bon vouloir de ces personnes-là, ben, ça peut être assez, euh, assez dramatique euh, ce qui peut se passer. 
Donc, je dirais qu'il y a comme un équilibre à trouver entre la perception de disponibilité et le besoin d'occupation et, euh, disons, le, le, ce, qu ce que le propriétaire va permettre ou, ou va endurer ou va, enfin, ou va collaborer avec ces gens-là ou pas. Mais les cas où, où moi, j'ai vu que ça fonctionnait, c'est quand il y, a, il y a une communauté organisée qui sont là et qui sont... Euh, à l'usure, vont avoir un gain de cause, euh, ou alors c'est tellement compliqué qu'on se dit bon, « c'est pas grave, euh, on ne sait pas trop quoi en faire euh, ». Mais entre les deux, c'est ça. Entre les deux, ça c'est plus difficile et souvent les gens vont être déplacés, ils peuvent être là un mois, deux mois, mais éventuellement ils vont être déplacés, les choses vont être démolies. C'est vraiment une bataille euh, entre l'accès euh, au lieu l'accès à la ville et la prédominance de la propriété privée. Il y a, il y a là un clash vraiment important qui, qui se joue. Ouais. Donc, ces lieux-là, je, je me suis peu attardée, en fait, mis à part à Beyrouth, je me suis peu attardée aux communautés ou aux personnes qui occupent, mais ça viendra peut-être, qui sait, euh, parce que c'est tout un, une autre... Euh, ce serait toute une autre façon de, de documenter. Probablement que ça serait davantage des... Euh, pour mettre en place une méthode davantage participative et, euh, et c'est des, des liens qui prennent du temps aussi à se mettre en place pour se, euh, gagner la confiance de ces gens-là. Moi, à Beyrouth, euh, les premières fois où je suis allée dans le quartier, on me regardait de travers, on me disait de partir, euh, on était à la limite menaçant. Puis, euh, au bout de trois ans, ben, on, les gens m'invitaient chez eux prendre un café. Là. Mais, je, tu sais, c'est il faut retourner, il faut être, faut être à l'écoute, il faut être gentil. Quand on dit partir, on s'en va. Euh, donc, c'est aussi un, un apprentissage de comment, comment aborder l'autre. C'est des situations difficiles. Euh, et c'est des gens qui ont l'habitude de se faire passer. Donc, qui, qui, résistent, qui résistent à la nouvelle personne qui débarque. Merci. Euh, ça me fait penser aussi à, à, aux approches... Euh sont de plus en plus documentés en, en anthropologie, l'anthropologie visuelle. C'est ce côté-là d'aller documenter la vie de, de certaines personnes, mais sans nécessairement... Bon, des fois, il y a la caméra, mais des fois, c'est juste au dessin, puis de raconter les histoires qu'on qu a observées par le dessin. Je pense que c'est un outil qui peut être intéressant pour les, les architectes, les gens qui conçoivent... Les, les, ils conçoivent par le dessin, mais le dessin est aussi, comme en parallèle à ça, un peu être une bonne source de un outil pour comprendre des espaces très complexes comme justement les, les vagues ou les espaces de Beyrouth qui doivent être difficiles à saisir un, sur une carte ou ouais. un plan de la ville. Oui, mais la, je dirais que peut-être la différence, c'est que dans mon cas, en tout cas, c'est que il y a cette documentation de cette rencontre qui a lieu, mais après, moi, j'ai ce désir là, de, de, de faire entrer ces lieux-là dans le discours de l'architecture. De, de dire que ces lieux-là ont, ont une valeur historique, constructive, euh, qu'il y a des savoir-faire qui sont là, qui se perdent si on les met à plat. Euh, et c'est vraiment de, de faire ce lien-là. Et donc, c'est pour ça que les dessins sont, en fait, ce sont des dessins d'architecture euh, qui sont dessinés aux instruments, avec les échelles, avec, euh, avec les mêmes savoir-faire qu'on ferait un, un dessin d'architecture, euh, en vue de, de les faire participer à ces différents discours qu'on pourrait dire normatifs, euh, standardisants, tout ça. Et donc, il y, a, il, y a, il y a un premier effort de documentation, de rencontre, mais après ça, il y a cet autre effort de le transformer en, en quelque chose qui entre en dialogue dans une histoire. Mm -hmm. ouais. euh, merci beaucoup. Euh, C'est fascinant. On en aurait pour longtemps. Je pense qu'on va devoir laisser la place à, à la prochaine présentation, mais euh, merci beaucoup encore. Puis, euh, Ça fait plaisir. On va suivre euh, les travaux euh, de Lucas. <rire> Merci. Um, thank you so much, William, for organizing this moment of us coming together. And I'll just remind folks in the space that we did live stream um, this conversation to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to share it with your friends and colleagues, you can go to Concordia University's fourth space on YouTube and you'll see the recording there now. Uh, perhaps we'll invite you to visit William's uh, uh, kind of exhibition towards the entrance of uh, For Space, if you still have a few minutes. But yes, on that note, we will close up the Zoom and thank you so much for your attention for being here. Bye, everybody.